Welcome back for another installment of Fellowship of the Rink, episode six here. With me, as always, is Joe Smith of The Athletic, bringing you all the insider info on your Minnesota Wild and Gophers hockey with some hints of craft beer, whiskey, and <laughs> Lord of the Ring factoids. Uh, Joe, why don't you just lead here? How are you holding up right now? Because you were possessed and decided you were going to just drive directly into the storm that's been brewing. <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, very uh, Lord of the, the Rings-esque adventure of getting on the road in Minnesota in the snow and driving. Uh, I had a pre-planned trip to uh, Des Moines, Iowa for the uh, some stories on the prospects here and uh, the, the program under Brett McLean. So it is a pocket in the wild schedule. They were off for four days. I thought it'd be a good time. And I initially thought in late March that it would have been beautiful spring weather like we saw like three weeks ago. Um, I was mistaken, but at least it is warmer here and not snowing, unlike it in Minnesota. So I did leave for some warmer, um, more palatable climate here. Yeah. The tropical oasis that is Des Moines. Um, well, we'll get into that a little bit more here in a minute. Uh, quick rundown of what we got today. Talk uh, about the Gophers and where they landed here in the, uh, postseason bracket, uh, talk Minnesota Wild, whether that's the Iowa trip that Joe just embarked on, the raging debate between Faber and Bedard, and just where the Wild season sits as of this recording. Uh, we got a great interview banked for you. We have our first double up. We've got John and Luke Middlestat. Uh, mm -hmm. Honestly, I thought that was one of the more fun interviews we've done. Um Finishing up here with, of course, the newest segment, Keyboard Warriors. We got some good hot takes queued up for you. And uh, Joe letting you know all the things you have to go read from him and Russo over at The Athletic. So kicking this off here, Gophers, Joe, big time. Sioux Falls. We've got uh, Omaha, Boston University, and RIT in our uh, little quadrant of the bracket. Are you going to get out at all for uh, any coverage for the regional or uh, obviously you'll be here for the frozen four, but what are your plans for coverage for the college tournament? That's a good question. Like, I think I would love to go to um, Sioux Falls for that. There's a wild game Thursday um, and then Saturday versus Vegas. So it may not be in the schedule for me to do that um, on my bucket list of going to see a game there. Um, I will be covering the Frozen Four and doing some stories leading up to the Frozen Four. Uh, if by chance the Gophers are in it like they were last year, I did a lot of coverage with them and kind of embedded with them um, last year. So we're hoping this middle stat interview kind of kicks it off a bit and then see how this bracket goes. Like I think it's all these brackets I think are really tough. Like they're not really any one that's cut quote unquote easy. Um, but Everyone it does. I was saying there was an easy one too. And I'm just like, wh where point the easy one? I don't, I don't I, see it. I don't see the easy one anywhere, even in the Michigan bracket that had the three Michigan teams uh, <laughs> in it. Um, but this sets up a potential rematch with BU and, and Minnesota, which uh, yeah. would be at a lot of eyeballs there and um, two story programs with the frozen four birth on the line. So, yeah, I, I think it sets up nicely for some of the top seeds to to get their way through. But there, there, there has to be some upsets. And I don't know if you have an upset you oh, wanted nice. to throw out there for for one of them. I don't see BC getting upset, like maybe Michigan State. I don't know. Yeah, be the... it's, it's tough because I honestly, BC, I could see just because no matter who they face in the second round, it's going to be either Wisconsin or Quinnipiac. Quinnipiac, we've seen it year after year. You can't overlook age in general, right? Mm -hmm. And just the experience of that team, especially coming off of what they did last year. And then Wisconsin now with – the new coaching, of course, snatched from Minnesota State Mankato. I don't know. it. That is one that I think people are overlooking. Am I going to pick BC to be beaten? No. But I think people are kind of glancing past that too quick. I feel like everyone's like hot team right now is Denver because of how they finished off the NCHC tournament, the frozen faceoff. Uh, everyone's all excited about Zeev Boyum being the target for the Minnesota mm -hmm. Wild. And I think everyone's just going to pile on that bandwagon. And again, I don't think that's an easy region to come out of. Um, I don't know. There's If we're going pure upset drive, depends on what you qualify as an upset. But 
I I do think that North Dakota comes out of the Michigan region. Um, I think that they're much more primed, but like all four teams very much have a chance. And of course, Michigan can now sit back and see what Minnesota had to deal with last year mm-hmm. <laughs> with their regional and uh, maybe take back or delete some of those comments. Um, I really like the idea, though, and this is a you know, stretch, whatever. If Minnesota manages to get through their regional, Maine getting through theirs and getting a rematch back from the early 2000s, Maine versus Minnesota to see who goes to the championship game. Mm-hmm. What a beautiful Jersey matchup. What a great story, too, with Maine back on the scene after so long. And I'm sorry, Bradley Nato is just wow. Like he is a difference maker. No, absolutely. I think I actually covered that Frozen Four in Minnesota. I think it was, was it 02? Wasn't it? I'm trying to remember if it was 01 or 02. But yes. I think Michigan was in it, I think. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, obviously having covered a Frozen Four in, in the state of hockey, looking forward to it this year as well after last year being in Tampa. But yeah, I don't see all the upsets could happen. Like I'm curious more on your take on the the site, the venues uh, for these regionals. It's the hot topic of are these places big enough uh, for the the traveling section of fans that I seen the prices like eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars for the games in St. Louis. I was like, holy! Like I just don't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I spent less on my Michigan football national title trip to uh, Houston. <laughs> um, so. Like I like the regional sites, the idea of them. Like I don't think we should have all these regional games in a big arena. Like I think the whole idea is having that kind of advantage or disadvantage, or just having that clo- that more of a college feel to it. Yeah. But I do feel bad for like when you have these huge fan bases that are trying to go all vie for tickets. That there's only so many you can get. Well, and it it is just, and we'll get into I guess uh, early uh, one of the comments under the keyboard warrior segment but mateo chimed in it's not that hot to anyone except for the ncaa but it's time for the one seed to host their regionals and it it couldn't be more true i mean there's a lot of reasons you can talk about outside of this one incident incident but north dakota uh, we love to hate each other like there's no love lost between me and north dakota fans but their fan base is so strong they travel so well and you're going to put them in an arena that holds 2,500 people? Are you joking? Like, how how is that a host site for any of these regionals, let alone the team that's probably going to travel the best out of all of the teams that are in the, the group of 16? And the Michigan teams, you know. Um... Michigan teams. Like, it, it's insane to me. I don't know. it. That seems like a big misstep by the NCAA. And maybe that alone will help catapult us into getting the discussion reopened on how we're going to pick these regionals. Maybe it becomes something where it's more like NCAA basketball and you just have like repeated locations where you're going to go back to every year. Like I, I don't hate that as long as it's a venue that can support it, you know, but it, it is crazy that those tickets are that expensive. Like I, I feel bad for anyone from Michigan or North Dakota. The college kids, especially like, you know, like it's one thing for like alumni to step in and go to the Rose Bowl or whatever like that. But a lot of the, the fun, a lot of the passion, a lot of the atmosphere is of the student sections, right? Like, you know, maybe they sell those student tickets. They have a deal for those, right? For the schools. Maybe they have that kind of deal. Like they have student mm-hmm. pack- packages for the, for Yoast or whatever, but maybe it's just, ins- it's insane to think of as a, remember me as a college kid trying to, you know, I think our tickets for our full season package for football were like $85 for the season or something like that. Or it was something insane well, for it, Michigan it, football. It sucks for the players too. Like they want there to be a good atmosphere and good crowd. And you're basically squashing that when you mm-hmm. have like entry price set at $800. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Pretty, pretty embarrassing. But uh, again, maybe this is what shines the light on uh, NCAA reviewing their practice a little bit more. Um, Sioux Falls this weekend. Your Gophers take on Omaha Thursday night, 7.30 Central on ESPNU. Winner of that will go on to play the winner of Boston University and RIT on Saturday at 5.30 on ESPNU. Anyone that hasn't already, go check out 
MNCAA. That's at MN underscore NCAA on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. Um, we've got a couple of brackets going through our friends at Better Edge. We have one with free entry, and we got prizes from sponsors like Waggle Golf and Barrel Theory, and we have a couple others that are trickling in depending on how much participation we get. There's a $10 entry pool, and the top three will get paid out. But again, check it out. I'll be sharing it all week, but uh, go follow MNCAA if you want to uh, stay current on all the details. Minnesota Wild, Joe, let's talk a little bit more about your trip down to Iowa. What's been going on down there and, you know, what's been kind of a, a bummer season down there? Yeah, you know, like I think, you know, going into this year, you know, the new program with Brett McLean taking over for Tim Army, who was there for several years. Um, you know, we talked about kind of building a culture, um, like, you know, obviously a fun culture here and uh, part of that winning is a winning culture if you want to be successful in developing players and so far this year has been a struggle and a, what i've found a lot is it's been a perfect storm of issues from losing a lot of their top guys they had veteran defensemen ready to mentor their young kids and to go to mermis and such and he was their captain the next day after he was named captain he was sent up to the minnesota wild and never returned you know and you you lose some of your veteran players there uh, they had guys that were called up of course uh to the wild but um you know clearly you know, there's a focus there on, on developing their young defenseman, Cody Franzen, who I talked to for one of the interviews here, uh, has been a big help since he came over on midseason when they had the coaching change uh, to have some hands-on work on the ice and also in the video room. Uh, I've seen that in person, just what he's been able to do to kind of, as a guy who recently was playing uh, in the AHL, NHL, uh, to give them some expert advice there. So. My story basically is a big picture story of the development program, the kind of the state of it um, for the wild and a lot of other smaller other stories. You know, Esper Wallstadt sat down with him for a while and uh, talked to Vladdy first off, uh, who's back in Iowa um, and looking really good. So we'll have a lot of prospect coverage in the next few weeks uh, on the athletic, um, especially, you know, considering the, the circumstances of the most likely the wild won't be in the playoffs. So, um, leave a lot more focus uh, on the future uh, and next season, which um, a lot of the guys that we'll be writing about um, will be potentially part of that in the fall. Yeah, and we'll repeat this throughout the episode, but how much longer do they have to get that $1 per month promo? I'll double check, and I believe it's still going on right now. It usually goes on for um, several weeks, so I would imagine it goes on until uh, the playoffs start, but I think – I'll double check that, um, but it, it doesn't last like forever, but it should be going on at least right now um, through our Brock Faber week slash prospect uh, watch slash uh, the end of the regular season here. That's right. Go to any article link and you'll be prompted if you are not currently signed up and subscribed. Um, on that, though, talking about the future and trying to look at the positives with everything, uh, we got a couple of announcements this week on ELCs being signed by Riley Height, much anticipated with how he's gone off in the WHL this year. And then uh, Jack Pert from uh, your St. Cloud State Huskies. Obviously, none of them were unexpected, per se, um, especially Riley Height. Um, thought maybe he'll sign after the playoffs, but uh, clearly uh, he's been extremely impressive this year one of the top scorers in the entire uh, WHL uh, really rounding out his game and uh, all the story that'll be up when this podcast goes up on Wednesday on, on Riley, a future talking to him, his teammates some family, obviously and some wild uh, execs and coaches here on just why they think this guy's could make some noise in this, in, in the fall and, and potentially be on that roster opening night. Um, he just been that good, um, that uh, reliable defensively to, um, you know, so it's uh, has a lot of good vibes going for him. And so he'll be uh, an interesting guy to, to follow as development camp happens. And of course, um, the prospect showcase uh, in the fall. But that story is coming on Wednesday uh, when this podcast comes up. Beautiful. And what's your take just in general with with Jack? If the Wild weren't at risk to lose his rights, is he going back for a senior year? That's a good question. Like I, I'm looking forward to talking to him today. He'll be at the rink in Iowa. And I want to I'll ask that question of like, how hard was that decision actually, you know, come back for another year. Um, they were optimistic that he would, he would sign. 
Um, they obviously have a lot of prospects in the Iowa right now, young guys playing. So it's a matter of getting him playing time as well. Won't be tonight, but it'll be, he'll be playing some games down the stretch here uh, on an ATO uh, for his first pro pro taste. But um, clearly when you have this log jam of, of guys down here and you probably would want to get a veteran player to, to model with them. Um, I would have to think that one or two, you know, could be potential, um, you know, trade assets in the future here uh, just because of the fact that you can't, you know, a keep them all. B, I know you have some, like like uh, the, the top six or seven at the NHL level is pretty much set for the next couple of years. Bogosian signing, Chisholm, uh, RFA, he'll probably be re-signed. Um, you know, Faber, you know, Spurgeon, and Brodeen are under contract. So like, there's not a lot of room to to add guys into that that group in the next couple of years. So I think if these guys can start in, in, increasing their uh, you know, be able to improve their game. They could be guys that the that Bill Guerin could potentially dangle if you're looking for making some moves in the next year or so when the salary cap space does uh, increase uh, as you're building on this roster. Very fair. And as we talk about building on this roster and looking to the future, the raging debate of late, whether that's in uh, the article that you put out yourself or Russo going head to head with Lazarus, Faber versus Bedard, it's got Twitter going crazy. What do you got here? I muted my mentions uh, and did not. Uh, there are 353 comments on my favorite story from Monday, and I started reading them for a while, uh, and then I stopped. And, How many uh, of them are crying Jordan memes? Oh, uh, well, I mean, I'm sure there's some on the, you know, there was some like below me and all those others like that. Um, some other more colorful ones, but it's it's clearly it strikes a chord with with fans on both sides and it became like a mini Minnesota fan versus Chicago fan in the comment section, which if you're interested in that kind of um, stuff, you can absolutely go and enjoy. Um, what, what I don't get is there shouldn't be, it's not a unanimous thing, right? It shouldn't be, Oh, like Faber should absolutely win or Bedard should absolutely should win. Like I get the fact that Bedard has been impressive and he very well could win the, the Calder. And he probably is the favor right now. But my whole story was just making the case that the Faber does have a, a strong case, that there is argument to be made that his season, while not as flashy, is maybe more impressive than what Bedard has done. And I think Bedard getting injured for that those many games opened the door a bit because his stats probably would be um, even harder to ignore if he played a full season. But, you know, they say the defenseman is the hardest position other than goalie to play. And it takes often 200 games for them to find their footing. And for him in game 60, something of his... And he shows a career to be playing top pairing, top power play, top penalty kill minutes, um, not sheltered at all. Like, you know, and playing it really well at, at levels that you've seen from previous Calder winners like Kale McCarr, um, you know, kill uh, the c contenders like the Quinn Hughes and Mort Sider. Um, he has some better numbers than him as far as like expected goals against and goals for. So, you know, my uh, argument that I dared to have made is that it's possible that Brock Faber should be getting some, some love and some votes from, and it'll be voted by people like myself, professional hockey writer association uh, does these, that, you know, have these voting rights and it'll be controversial, I'm sure. And um, you know, there's still a good chance that, but our wins, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's more so getting that information out there, both from talking to NHL players and executives and scouts and, showing some analytics and numbers and charts to be like, Hey, this is, this is why it's been a big deal for him. Yeah. It, it's crazy to see some of the arguments on both sides, right? Like there's wild fans who are pretty rose colored glasses when it's talking about, Oh, Bedard really hasn't done anything. Like he's had an impressive season, no doubt. But then you got the Bedard side where, Oh, how many points does Faber have? Like, do you understand what conversations being had right now? <laughs> well, it's like both ways. Like it's not just that Bedard is minus thirty eight. Let's let's <laughs> let's write him off, right? That's not right. the argument against Connor Bedard. Obviously, playing two way game is important, um, and all that stuff. Uh, that's it goes into that argument that Faber has been playing both sides uh, on a more consistent level. But I'm not saying don't vote for Bedard because he's a minus thirty eight. I understand they're a horrible team. I understand who he's playing with, and I understand. He's going up against every top defensive pair, just like Brock Faber's going up against every top line. So it's not like he's playing against stiffs here, but I don't know. It's the, the fact that they hadn't had Brodine and didn't have Spurgeon most of the year. 
mm-hmm. you know, he's playing in this heavy role. And and they're, I know that they're, they're not quote unquote meaningful games like playoff games, but they've been in the thick of a playoff chase for a long time. So not like, you know, these are some high leverage, at least as high leverage you can get for whatever season, whatever season game. So yeah. anyways, it's going to go on and on. Uh, I know how hard it is to vote because I've done it before. And I know it yeah. sometimes for a defenseman, it takes some watching him every day or often to really appreciate the things that they do. And so I get why BB voters in California or Colorado or Florida, are like maybe just don't watch favorable than maybe twice a year. It'd probably be hard to make the argument like, Hey, I, I just see all the highlights of Bedard. How can I not vote for him? Yeah. But when you, when you cover the person every day, you see them every day and you talk to people who, who coach and play against them, that respect around the league has been pretty impressive considering has only been in the league for like 70 overall games. Yeah, and I mean, it. it's tough, too, because a lot of people can't separate the whole concept of this season and what they've done to impact the game as a rookie versus longevity. Like, Connor Bedard, more than likely going to go down as a better NHL player than Brock Faber. Like, that's just the nature of how people view the game and the things that he's going to be able to create offensively, especially as this team gets better. It, no shit. But I, I think this is fun for a lot of reasons too. Like we've got polar opposites. Like we've got the guy who is absolutely dominating defensively and the guy who's doing ridiculous things on offense. And we're probably looking at the future captain of both teams. And for a long time, we're going to see them going head to head and they're going to turn up their game going up against each other with all of this developing. It's going to make for good rivalry, good banter on going. And I think it's just going to elevate both of their play long term. But th- let's just throw both of them in a rink together. No one else. Mm-hmm. Cage match. Just whoever whoever outperforms the other will settle this uh, pay per view style. And they're both, I think, really too nice too. Like both of them <laughs> are like like they probably wouldn't get you know no holds barred and kill each other. They'd probably res- respect the hell out of each other and they'd probably you know. dick each other. Like Bedard's like, oh no, Faber should win. Faber's like, no, Bedard should win. And it's like, God, I, I guarantee you, if I, when I asked Faber about Bernard, he was just gushing. Like, this guy's a superstar in the league already, like, yeah. <laughs> point per game. Like, the guy is unbelievable. And and Bernard has a lot of respect for Faber, too, of just, like, knowing how hard it is to um, to defend these guys in this league. So uh, the mutual respect will be there for a long time. We'll be battling forever. Pretty soon, you see both those guys with mega contracts. And, like, I wrote in my story, like, they'll be having some conversations for bigger awards in their future, I believe, between – Hart Trophy down the line, potentially Norris Trophy. I think Faber has the ability to kind of contend for that at some point. Um, so I think no matter who loses, they're not going to be freaking out unless they have some crazy bonus in their contract that they can uh, for the Calder Trophy. But I think Bill Guerin would be all for him getting the Calder no matter what it took. As, and he's a big, he's a huge proponent of like, he's like, Brock Faber should win the Calder Trophy. Yeah. No, nope. it's awesome. That's really. As far as the positives go right now, let's just rip the Band-Aid off. (laughs) Wild season, pretty much done, all intents and purposes, especially after Monday night, basically being doomsday scenario with how uh, the two games going on unfolded. Yeah, it's, you know, they couldn't afford to have both teams get a point in St. Louis and Vegas, and for Vegas to win, obviously, in overtime, March or so. You know, just when the Wild were hoping that Vegas would go on this horrible slide, they've turned things around a bit, and... To be eight points out with 11 games to go, um, I know the Wilds have two head-to-head meetings with Vegas, and you, that's if you bank those two and not give up any points in that, you know that's still another four um, left. And so, essentially, they lost all their margin for error, which they, I think it's it's, it's hard to imagine them making. The, I think they have 1.7 percent chance now, according to the latest odds, to make the playoffs. So there is a, a slow, slim chance, but. It would require a, a lot of would require a lot of things to go right for them, and you know, I think Saturday could be the death knell if it, if it already hasn't happened one yet with Vegas. If they don't win that game, obviously, it's it's mathematically probably already over at that point. Well, and mentally over if they don't win the San Jose game, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's just tough too, and you had full control, right? If if you can beat St. Louis in either of those games, be show something more against LA. And I know the game's not as bad as the final score indicated, but still that that's not the showing you want to see when your season's on the line. Um, I don't know. It It's tough. And again, there's bright spots to look forward to. Like we've got Faber, we've got, you know, height in the conversation. 
I think the real interesting one, and uh, let's throw in our uh, quote of the week for Lord of the Rings. Uh, even the smallest person can change the course of the future. And of course, you all know immediately that I'm referencing not uh, the size of his quads because he's right there with Marty St. Louis, but Marco Rossi polarizing guy right now like people can't decide everyone's either like yeah he's like a total lock keep him up there with Kaprizov or get him out of here trade him now oh he can't hold up in the playoffs because he's small like where do you land on the Marco Rossi discussion yeah I, I think I'd be careful of trading a guy like that too soon um I just know just from historically speaking this franchise looking for number one centers for a long time before I got here. And while he may not seem right now is like the no doubt, like Hunter Bedard, number one in the center of the future, you know, he's had a quietly, a very, very strong rookie, second rookie season, you know, 20 goals. Um, he's played in the top six. Uh, he has a great motor. He's great work ethic. Uh, he's small, but he's like, he's thick. And so he's strong. He's hard, strong on battles in the, in the corners and stuff. Not flashy, but he plays well defensively. So if Eric Sinek is a number one center, which he's played like one and scored like 30 goals and, and being a sulky caliber defender, and he's a number two center, like, is that really that bad? You know, um, and he's an entry level contract. And so, yeah, like, you know, the question isn't whether, like, I think he's a, a, a quality center they should keep. So I think the question, which makes it a debate, is whether the Wild feel that way going forward. If they are, if they're, if they're, completely bought into the fact of, Hey, this guy is a guy we're going to lock in long-term and invest our future in. Uh, we, we, we liked him at the draft. We think he's, he's a really good player, but um, it, your, your future is only tied to, to your organization and how much they believe in you. And so this was an, definitely an encouraging step. I would have to think if your feeling about him was so, so going into the last season when they called the biggest summer of his life and they, he said I was all summer in Minnesota and worked out and, and want to make sure he was ready to start the year uh and the roster i think the first years has been success for him in terms of proving he can play at this level so um there will be some competition coming up you know with riley height coming in there um you know you're off as a winger so um may not make him to play center quite right away kusin is more of i think a middle six guy maybe a third line, third line center um so those guys that they want to find for top six centers don't come cheap you know Ryan Hartman's making $4 million. You know, he's been playing a lot of third line later on the season. So uh, I'm more inclined to to keep him, you know, at least give it another year to see how this develops because I know those how hard those guys are to find and how expensive they are to acquire. For sure. Well, with that, Joe, let's kick it over to, uh, again, great interview here with the Middlestat clan. This interview with John and Luke Middlestadt is brought to you by our friends at Waggle Golf. <clears throat> Waggle Golf believes what you wear on the course should reflect your individuality, who you are, where you're from, your hobbies, interests, and passions. All the stuff that makes you, well, you. That's why every design is inspired by the desire to create a piece of apparel that strikes a chord when you see it, that makes you say, Wow, that was made for me because in a lot of ways it was. Ready to get your waggle on? Go to getyourwaggleon.com, load up that cart, and apply promo code SP10 for 10% off that order. Getyourwaggleon.com, promo code SP10. Pleased to be joined by, well, not one of us technically, but two of us by way of Eden Prairie, Minnesota, with several state tourney appearances, I'm, I'm not even going to count them, and a championship to boot. Now both members of your Minnesota Golden Gophers, John and Luke Middlestat. How are we doing, boys? Doing well. We're doing well. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Yeah. We had uh, a few Gophers on earlier this year with Oliver Moore and uh, and Snuggerud and stuff, so they uh, set the bar pretty high. For the uh go for standards there as, as you should probably expect uh, yeah, those two. yeah for sure for sure uh, I, i'd argue they set the bar pretty low here for the opening question though and <laughs> i don't know if they teed you guys off for this but uh rorschach test 
when you look at the Minnesota Wild logo, what do you see? I see woods. Well, you can see like an eye, and it's like a some sort of animal too. I that's all I that's all I, I have heard that. Yeah, but I see trees in the sunset. I think I don't know. I don't know. I, if you told if you tell me what it is, I'll know it. But I forgot. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. There yeah, is yeah. no answer. Like everyone has a different answer. We've been told nature seen like Oliver Moore was baffled when we told him that there was also a bear. Um, we had Declan Chisholm on and he only saw the bear. And then we had, <laughs> and then we had Adam Beckman who thought it was a UFO. So like, there's, there's no wrong answer here. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> One of the most creative uh, logos there is probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a good logo. Yeah. It's a, since this is, um, you could probably hear the playoff, the uh, Lord of the Ring, Lord of the Rings podcast here. Are you guys Lord of the Rings fans at all? Have you seen any of the movies or any of the No, I haven't. Or? I haven't seen a single movie. <laughs> there we go. Do you guys have any kind of nerd itch? Like a movie, a book? Like are you Harry Potter guys? Do you collect coins or Pokemon cards? Like <laughs> what's, uh, what's your weird I, nerd itch? I actually watched the Harry Potters for the first time this year, and I haven't read the books, but absolutely love the movies. Um, not much of a, I wouldn't say I'm like a nerd for it, but I enjoyed the movies for sure. Yeah. I think, uh, my big thing is like my nerdy is star Wars. I don't know. Okay. I mean, I'm not like, I don't love it, but, um, if <laughs> yeah. it ever, if it ever turns on, I'm, I'm for sure watching. Yeah. Everyone has their kind of, you know, nerd demo, so to speak, you know, uh, yeah. you know, like my wife got me into Lord of the Rings more than I, we do the Lord of the weekend every year. We watch all three episodes, all three movies, four hours each and just have some drinks and some snacks and watch that in a cold Minnesota weekend. So, um, Perfect. it's one, one way to do a, a binge watching, which hope you have, uh, <laughs> you have, you need enough time to do that, but it takes a while. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, we, uh, thanks for having you guys on. Um, you know, people might be surprised like you guys weren't this the hockey family wasn't created in a lab or a hockey factory. Like I heard from like your parents weren't big into hockey, right? Did you call your dad D three? Is that true? Yeah, we call them D3. <laughs> yeah, we call them that growing up. Um, and, yeah, they never played hockey growing up. I think what did dad play? played uh, football. and Yeah, my dad played football and baseball at St. Olaf. Yeah. And uh, never – he said he always wanted to play hockey growing up. He just never had the opportunity to do it, and he always loved it. My mom had nothing to do with hockey whatsoever. <laughs> and, yeah, our dad just threw it, threw us into it, and we, like, fell in love with it right away. So. Mm-hmm. So didn't skip a generation. You have like a grandparent, you know, like Snuggerud who played hockey, you know, like you have like other pre- pre- previous genes that yeah. set this whole thing up. Not that um, I know of for sure, but I don't think so. So like what got you, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know, your brother is a, a big part of it, but like what got you started in hockey other than living in Minnesota? And that's what everybody does. Yeah. Well, obviously, like you said, Casey was a huge part for us because we saw how much he loved the game and now how hard he worked at it, like at a young age. And I think that just like drove us to love hockey because he loved it so much. Also, we had a sport court in our backyard and we'd go back there and shoot pucks in the summer and our dad would flood it in the winter. And we just learned to love it by just having fun playing it. That's really it. So, yeah. Did you, so were all three of you guys out there? I know there's an age difference there. A little. Yeah, bit. we were all three out there all the time. Yeah. So how does that work? Like, is Casey the oldest? So he's like stuck with dad and boots against the two of you? Or how do you split three? You just, I, oh, actually, well, for like knee hockey, I remember this. We would have one goalie, one net, and we play one on one. That's what we would do and fight every time. My mom just knew. a war. Yeah, it was a war. war. Chaos. My mom knew beforehand there was going to be a fight and she hated it. Yeah. Hated <laughs> knee hockey. So, but I think it's kind of, that's, that's where we learned like to be competitive and you know, it's part of the reason we're probably here. So. And who came out on top in knee hockey? Probably Casey. Probably Casey. He's like 40 pounds heavier than us. So. <laughs> yeah, I, that, that helps. I went to like Victor Hedman's hometown. He used to cover the lightning and in his basement on um, Ovik, Sweden, there's all these like uh, marks on the wall in the basement and like dents in the floorboards and stuff like that. I figure mm-hmm. like your guys place had, a lot of remnants of, oh of those hockey battles at some point. Yeah, it did. Uh, that's part of the reason my mom hated it too, is we would absolutely destroy the walls. And we had friends' basements that 
had like the perfect new hockey basement and we destroyed their basement every time. Definitely put a few holes in there. So that's just what knee hockey does for some reason. <laughs> yeah, we had the unfinished basement, so we were good. No, oh, dry that's that's the best. Like, yeah. They, I don't think they started the renovations when I was a senior in high school. So they, they knew they did it right. Yeah. That's, that's smart. That is smart. Those are the best placements for knee hockey for mm-hmm. sure. Oh, we, we did that. Uh, I think the, the craziest one was like legit airsoft battles in that basement. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's sick. That is crazy. That's fun. <laughs> Those BBs everywhere. Oh, everywhere. Wow. You have no idea. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's like glitter. You keep finding that shit for years. Yeah, we oh. we had uh, a sport court, obviously, and we had airsoft BBs just underneath the sport court. Pissed my dad off so much. Yeah, like, oh, like stuck in the little like cracks and yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Square holes. Oh, yeah. terrible. That pissed him off. So. Terrible. Yeah. Uh, now talk about just like growing up in Eden Prairie. I mean, from playing with guys that are kids of former NHLers to really the middle stat name being in the middle of the best stretch of hockey we have seen from Eden Prairie. What's it like? Yeah. I mean, it was a ton of fun, like playing with him. And then um, I think my sophomore year, we had a pretty crazy run to the state championship and, you know, obviously ended in a loss, but like that run, I think was for everyone. Like, I mean, we can, we can do this if we want, like we just got to work hard. And um, obviously watching Casey do it too, it was, was big for us. And, I mean, all those memories that surround the state tournament, uh, I mean, those are like the best memories of my life playing hockey. And I'm sure a lot of kids who have played in that tournament can relate. So, yeah. Well, I mean, you guys from 09 to 2021, nine mm-hmm. appearances and one championship. Not a big deal, Luke. <laughs> Is it weird to you guys at all that you were still only the second most hated team in the state behind Edina? Um, I don't, no, it wasn't weird. Yeah, no, no, no. we all hate Edina, so I was gonna say no. <laughs> oh, like I'm sure your, I'm sure your parents, were, I'm sure your parents were asking if they had seen tickets to the X for the for the state tournament. I'm sure you know just after all the back to back to back at old time. Oh yeah, just for old times. Yeah. And you guys had a lot of ridiculous teams, but actually, the the one thing I want to pull up here, and I'm actually gonna uh, pull a video up on the screen. One second here. I need you guys to talk to me about this magnificent, majestic <laughs> creature. Oh my gosh. Jake Casey. So funny. I had a, uh, I had a science class with him and we sat right next to each other and I don't remember who would sit behind us, but it was our friends and they'd stick pencils in his hair and he would have no idea. <laughs> and I mean, Oh, if you knew him too, he's not, he's not that type of guy to do that. He's, Super quiet and humble, just the nicest guy. Yeah, like he wasn't craving attention. Yeah, it's just like the the attention just came to him. Yeah, like it just people loved it. Yeah, he was a meme immediately. Oh my gosh! Yeah, he's yeah, he's I was he's an icon. Yeah, so funniest video ever. Right before that, Jake Luloff staring down the camera is (laughs) looks insanely creepy. It's just the one-two punch of a lifetime. So how much is it like talked about before you guys go out there for the first game of the tournament? Like, is everyone like talking through all the stuff they're going to do? Do people kind of keep it to themselves? Um, well for us, we all got haircuts. So like, if you, if you look at the, like all of us probably had short hair and then Drew Holt, Jake Casey, Carter Batchelder, I think they all kept their long, like curly, crazy hair. And, um, I don't know for us, I think it was, we wanted to act like we had been there before. Um, we didn't. We didn't really want to do a ton of crazy stuff, but um, yeah, like that type of stuff happens, and obviously you're gonna laugh about it. And it's, it's, I mean, a lot of those guys are just making memories, and yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Like this year was watching those skate ups were the funniest things I've ever seen. Like those kids, oh, were, they were so creative. I think. Oh, my favorite was probably just the regular toothpick. A kid just stares down the camera with a toothpick, and it's like, how do you think of that? I, I like the guys that troll. The guy that, like, went up, and I don't know, me watching, I can tell he intentionally fell, but the whole internet's like, oh, my God, I can't believe this guy fell. I'm like, you guys are so dumb. God damn it. What was that? Was that Hermantown or Warro? 
I don't even remember who it was now. The only the only one that I vividly remember because like I locked in on this so hard was the goalie for Creighton who had the Zubaz pads. I Incredible. See that. I see that. Oh, like you know the Vikings like Zubas pants? No. Like it's like tiger stripe almost, but it's oh, like right. and yellow and purple. Yeah. Yeah, 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 we stayed yeah. with Creighton over winter break and I remember those tiger pads. They're crazy. Oh, so cool. Yeah, yeah. The other one was the the leopard print hair coming <laughs> down. It's like that's so it's just like too far, but it's so funny. It is so funny. He does the, looks, the stupid like stare down. He opens his mouth and oh my gosh, just crying. It's so funny. I love the goal celebrations too. Like it's uh you know when did it start? Where they you score a goal and you go right to the student section and jump into the boards like that? What year did that kind of start? Um, well, I think the big Casey, one was maybe Casey was doing that a lot. He didn't do the full ice though. Well, yeah. they, they said you can't, you can't celebrate into the other team's student section. So it was like, you got to celebrate into some student section. I think, <laughs> I think Jackson Blake had a big part in this. He was, yeah. he loved the full. He was ice. doing so, it. He was doing it before anyone else I knew was doing it. And yeah. I was like, Oh my gosh. Like, yeah. You had to crazy. chase him down yeah. the ice. Yeah. Well, and talk about like playing with some of those guys, like, he just got nominated here for Hobie Baker, but I mean, going down the list, like you guys played with Lang and Brunner, uh, you know, Ben Steves up Duluth. You guys had some really good players come through in Prairie. Like, what is it like playing with all those guys? Yeah, it's, it's so cool. I mean, you just get better and it's a lot easier when there are really good players out there in high school. So like, and we also work out with them in the summer every day. They're, they're our best friends. We golf with them as well. Um, yeah, I think we just have always pushed each other to get better, and it's it's definitely put us where we are at today. So, did yeah. anybody ever bother recruiting you guys other than Minnesota? Like, did they people just figure you're going to Minnesota, so they didn't, they didn't even try? Like, or <laughs> was there other like, did you take visits to other places, or was it always going to be? We kind of just told everybody else, uh, no, but we we did do a visit to Wisconsin um, before All like, places. <laughs> Gross. Yeah, before they were. Uh, before Minnesota reached out to us and we, we weren't, we weren't going to go there, but it was Minnesota. Like no doubt about it. Like it wasn't an option. Is, is the rumor true that the only reason they even let Casey play there is because they wanted to lock up the two of you joining too. I think that's true. Yeah. Cause I think uh, what I heard is when we were there, when Casey was there, they were just waiting for us to come in. So the Casey was kind of just a decoy. I don't know though. I don't want to solidify anything, but I think well, it's true. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I think it was too. actually players. I think it was EP, um, the Spielman kids. They played lacrosse. Yep. And yeah, JD was sick. I, I coached against him, and it was not fun. And I don't know if it's true, but the rumor that was out there is that they recruited his older brother to play uh, lacrosse at Ohio State. And as soon as JD decommitted and said he was going to go play football at Nebraska, like – his brother never played again no way i didn't That's know that crazy. So I, it's crazy though hearing how like I, i've always seen like the older brother and then you know the younger follow but like to bring in the older brother to entice the younger brother is like quite the bold play given the yeah. landscape of college sports right now where like anyone can decommit and hit the transfer portal whenever they want yeah, yeah it's crazy for sure JD was an insane he athlete was though oh, so my good at lacrosse Freak. i remember him yeah, yeah. Oh, oh man. yeah, he he was something else. Um, yeah, he was. John, I gotta was, ask you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, what was the the draft like going with with Casey? Like, what was that whole experience like? It was a really cool experience. We were in Chicago and uh, we just had an amazing hotel room. I don't know, it was just really cool. We were in the back room as well. Um, yeah, I it was just a really cool experience. It's no one really else gets to experience that, so it was pretty cool for sure. Mm -hmm. What's it like for you, Luke, like going through your first year of eligibility, not being drafted, and then this past year being taken? Like, did you have expectations? Did you think like there were teams talking to you that you expected to pick you up, or how did that all shape out? Yeah. Um, so actually my first year I went undrafted, but I was on like the central scouting. And then my second year I went undrafted, but I was on the central scouting. So then my third year, I was like, all right, like I'll probably be on central scouting again, but doesn't matter. Like whatever happens, happens. And um, 
yeah, so I was a three year like central scouting vet. I don't know how how many times that has happened, but um, yeah, I'm glad Montreal picked me. And yeah, it was it was a little crazy ride, but I think like long run, it was good for me to have that adversity and pissed me off a little bit too, for sure. So um, yeah. Well, how how tall are you? Five eleven. Uh, there it is. I think we just solved the mystery. <laughs> there it is. Yep. <laughs> You couldn't, you couldn't just like stand on your toes, just a touch or like put a little, sure, pad you. <laughs> put some pucks in my pocket, a little heavier. I don't if, know. You were, if you were six foot, even you probably would have been like a second round draft pick. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good point, but <laughs> we'll see. Well, Lane, Lane Hunt isn't that tall, right? Lane Hudson's Hudson's pretty kind of a smaller he's, dude. He's, a, he's kind of a different breed though. That guy. I don't know. He just, he's just, he's a, a pluck, like, nothing I've ever seen before. He's a guy that would have probably gone top five had he not been that tall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Yeah, sure he would have been. He's crazy. Now, John, if we're at the Thanksgiving dinner table with the whole family, who's got the trump card? Casey going top ten in the draft, or Luke having the Stanley Cup or the well Stanley Cup state tourney championship? Um, I think it's the state tourney, hundred percent. Like an answer. I think that. <laughs> Like, we all wanted that so badly. Like, that was just the biggest thing for us. Like, we all wanted that state tournament. Um, I mean, obviously, Casey has some bragging rights for that. There's no doubt about it. But I would say the state tournament. I think that's a good answer. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Luke, I was uh, talking to Faber about you guys on the on the decor. And I think Motzko said it's your decor is just as good this year as it was last year. And that had, you know three, four, five NHL players on that team. Just what made you guys kind of come together this year? Like, I think guys were just probably waiting for the opportunity, but it's not as easy just to step into kind of major roles uh, on a team that's expect expected to do so much. Yeah, I think um, we had our learn like a bit, bit of a learning curve earlier this year, but, um, you know, it's hard to replace Fabes, Comer, Yanni. Like, that's, that's not easy to do. Um, but... If you want to look at it that way, it's anyone you can put anyone out there, and we'll, we're we're all ready to do the job, and um, we're all capable. So, yeah, I think that's kind of just what it comes down to. Do you have a favorite Faber story from your time with him, and like what do you thought of him playing thirty plus minutes in the NHL right now? Gosh, <laughs> like I think every play that went into his corner, he killed in literally less than five seconds, and yeah. I just be sitting there on the bench. I'm like, how is he doing that? And then he. Lead the rush. Oh, oh they're no. turning off. I'll grab that. <laughs> you gotta do jumping jacks, yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, we're good. But yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm not that surprised to see he's playing that much because that guy's a mutant. But yeah, um, he's, yeah, he's a different know. breed. For I'm sure. happy for him. He's yeah, he deserves it. Has he come by the hockey house at all? Like, since he went to went to NHL, or is he kind of presented on grata? Like, is he like you know? I know. Yeah, we saw him once. Uh, when was that? Uh, Christmas. After Christmas break or something like that, he stopped by, hung out with us. So that was good. Yeah. Um, good to see him. For sure. He's still the same, same faves from last year. Yeah. So, yeah. Very controversial topic right now, apparently, especially if you talk to anyone in Chicago because people are getting real heated about it. Who well, should win what? this year? Calder Trophy. Oh, oh, well, I mean, I'd say Fabes is, plays what? 25 plus a night. I'd say that mm -hmm. that in itself is deserving. Yeah. But um, I, agree. I don't know. Bedard's having a good year too, but I'm on, I'm on the favorite train. Yeah. I'm on sure. favorite train too. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot more fun asking Oliver more. What did he say? <laughs> he wouldn't answer. Wow, he's a good politician. He's, he's a good politician. He's like, oh yeah, both of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, come on. I, I want Bedard giving me the puck too. I don't blame him. Yeah. That's yeah, fair. That's enough. fair. That's fair. Uh, now, John, both of them. So we had Oliver Moore and Jimmy Snuggerud, and both of them said uh, when we talked about guys that aren't talked about enough, like underappreciated, you were brought up immediately both times. Just like best work ethic guy that drives a lot that happens in the practices. What what's happening here? Why can Luke not be as hard of a worker as you? <laughs> I don't know. It's just. I think that's just like, that's just how I play. Like, Kook's definitely got more finesse in his game. I'm more like, just just like working hard and getting pucks in and battling it. And I think guys like notice that a lot. So, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Luke, what 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 do you think you can do to aspire to be more like John? Um, 
<laughs> well, I'm a defenseman, so it's hard for me to get on the four check. But um, I think that's the one thing I should take away is the work ethic for sure. <laughs> for Botska seems like a pretty straight lace, pretty like focused and intense coach. Like, do you have any favorite kind of like low key Moscow moments where he's kind of shown some personality and kind of like obviously relating to the kids, you know, these days, I mean, he recruits pretty well. So he has to be able to do that. Yeah. I remember like our recruiting trip, he was probably one of the best recruiters I'd ever talked to. Like, I think we were going to go to Minnesota no matter what, but um, I think like the stories that he told were like, like that's the type of culture that I want to walk into and play at. And um yeah, he has some one line sneaky one liners around the rink where it's like I wasn't expecting that. It was pretty good. Like uh up until I had scored, he was I'd walk past him and he'd say to me, That's enough, Luke. It's been long enough. And I'd be like, Yep, I'm working on it, trying to score. And he'd just walk away with like nothing. I was like, All right. But yeah, I mean he was right. And then I think I scored like a week later. So maybe he knows what he's doing. Yeah. But also just like walk in the locker room, look at everybody. And then just walk out, and everyone's just like, "What?" <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a funny he's a funny guy. That's good. Now I gotta ask. We've seen some of the fun that uh, Brady Kachuk has had the last couple of seasons in the primarily in the postseason, tagging along as uh, as Buddy Matt goes on and well, makes it to the finals, and they had another good run with Calgary. I know you guys can't hit the beers like he can, given your age, but. What are you guys going to do to top him when you go out and watch the Colorado Avalanche now that Casey's there? Oh, man. I don't know. I think we'll maybe have to get our dad to do something because I think that's the only thing that can truly top what they have going on. But um, if we can get out there for some playoff games, that would be that would be some serious fun. Yeah, so, well, we'll think of something we can do. Yeah, we'll have to brew it. something up. Yeah. So. Were you guys like the true like hockey insiders that day? Like, what was that day like? Did you know like ahead of time before news broke that he was getting moved? Like, I don't know if it caught him by surprise or caught you guys by surprise. No, or, like, yeah. That? So we're in between drills, and I think I'm safe to say this now. Our hockey ops guy Jacob Leroy comes up to me and is like, "Hey, Casey just got traded to the Avalanche." And I was like, "What? Like, that's crazy!" I literally just heard that he was not going to get traded, but I was like, "Wow!" So I go up to John after a drill. And I'm like. Yo, know, John, Casey just got traded. What? What? To where? <laughs> and uh, Coach was Coach Motzko standing right next to him. He goes, what? What happened? And John was like, uh, Casey just got traded. And uh, Motz came up to me and was like, how did you find out during practice? And I was like, oh, uh, Casey texted me right before. Because I didn't want Jacob to get in trouble. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, they didn't think anything of it. But, yeah, Jacob yeah. Leroy told me I during practice. I freaked out a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah. it had to be like a it had to be a kind of emotional thing right for him and i don't know how much you talked to him after that like of you know a team that drafts you and develops you obviously a big part of that future yeah. and they probably didn't want to have to give him up but they got obviously a good return for it but like what was that like to talk to him that day of, of him going to a team that's a legit cup of yeah. obviously like it was really really sad but like really cool at the same time like he's so excited right now he absolutely absolutely loves in Colorado. But uh, like he said, like, as he was leaving, he was getting texts from like his teammates and he was like, Oh no, like this is probably the hardest part. It's just like saying bye to all of his good buddies that he, he played with for played played at Buffalo for a while now. So, um, but like, like I said, it's super exciting and he's stepping into a, a very good situation with a Stanley cup contender. So uh, yeah. We had some uh, fun questions for you. I know Scott might have a few. Um, you're too young for this, but they had like the newlywed game back in the day on the, the you know, like the uh, TV shows for like asking people about each other. And since you guys are described as kind of like twins a little bit, I'd like to ask you about each other, um, see how well you know each other, um, I guess. And we'll start with easy softballs and we'll move along. Uh, yeah. First one, uh, Luke for about John, like who was his favorite NHL player growing up? Sidney Crosby. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's that's an easy one. Yeah. How about how about John for Luke? Do you know uh, Sidney Crosby? Yeah, all three of us were Crosby fans. We were all we were all Penguins. So okay, so that was an easy one. Yeah, mm -hmm. love that. Um, yeah, the biggest superstition for your brother. What's the biggest one that 
can't go without doing for you um do you have any we're not superstitious yeah. neither one of us are you a little stitious like <laughs> a little bit we um um you got your energy drink do you do that before every game though that's been recently oh well, yeah there you go yeah. i change things up all the time <laughs> same he doesn't have any superstitions either no. he never has He's always thought they were dumb. I remember him saying that. <laughs> what about most uh, annoying habit? And you've got to have one for each of the, you guys because, like, growing up together, like, what's the most annoying, like, pet peeve habit that your well, brother does? We, no, we got to flip it around, though, Joe. That's that's too easy. They know what each other's most annoying habits are. What do you think that your brother thinks your most annoying habit is? We'll start um, with you, John. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, my. He thinks he's perfect. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, that, that's your most annoying habit. You you think you're perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's his most annoying habit. No, I'm I mean, yeah. What uh, is it for him? Uh, no, what is your most annoying habit? Too I don't annoying. know. Yeah, I guess I can. I can be a little bossy at times. I guess so. Yeah, spot on. <laughs> Yours now. Yes, um, uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm. I'm a pretty good brother. I wouldn't really do Come anything. Come on, there's got to be one. To bother you. This guy's um, perfect. I think when I when I get under his skin a little bit, I don't stop. That's when I keep going. I'd say that's probably my most annoying habit. That's that's All true. Right. John, what's the real answer though? What's the real answer? What what annoys you? Um, he's very stubborn. Like something like that. Once he gets under my skin, he just <laughs> you're stubborn too. You're you're, you're you're definitely more stubborn than I am. Yeah. Oh. What what skill on or off the ice would you like to steal from your brother? Um, for for if I were to steal on John's, it's for sure. Like his first three steps are just like, boom. And then he's he's off. Um, I don't know how I missed out on that gene, but I, I would for sure for sure want that one. <laughs> um, I think for for Luke is just like the ability to see the ice like he does. I think he just make play makes plays that like. I would never think of making and uh yeah i think definitely that for me so if either of you guys weren't hockey players or that won't be your potential future like playing in the nhl what would be your brother's future job um i think i would say like it's pretty into making food so i would maybe open up a, his own restaurant or something like that i don't know he makes his foods all right but it's something he's into you know <laughs> So, wow. is that um, it, John? Are you gonna open a restaurant? You never know. Maybe <laughs> that's something I'd be interested in. Never thought of it, but um, for you, I maybe like a cashier at McDonald's. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Honestly, I I've only like thought of him as just like playing hockey, but I think he'd be good in some sort of business setting. I don't know. No, this is brilliant. John's buttering you up right now saying there's no option besides hockey because you're going to yeah, be a nice investor in the yeah. new restaurant. Norris Trophy winner. Yeah, yep, that, sorry, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. You know. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> uh, Scotty report on each other's golf game. Um, I'll, I'll give you one. Hits the ball about a mile and a half, and you're a little inconsistent a yeah, little bit, but yeah, I'd agree. Kills the ball, and when he's on, he's on. He's – He's probably mid seventies, and when he's off, he's off. Let's let's just say <laughs> that. Let's it. just say that. I agree with that. Uh, his game took a major step last summer. Yeah, there's yeah. no doubt about it. You know, I got I got to give him some credit. I think he. What was your low score? You shot 73, 74 last year. Seventy four. Seventy four. Yeah, up at the quarry, Giants Ridge. So, uh, yeah, his game's good. He's he just play simple. You know. Yeah. Nothing too crazy. Pucks in deep. He he likes the five foot off tee. He really likes that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Can anybody great. putt? Can anybody putt in your family, or is it all just off the tee? Like you guys can crush it, and no one has. Casey's a short game? really good. Casey's putting. a putter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that guy drains some crazy putts. Yeah. So <laughs> if if there's gonna be a scramble and we're gonna match Casey's putting with one of your game, who's Casey gonna pick as his partner? I would I would honestly say John because he just hits the ball so dang far, but um. Casey hits the ball far too. Yeah, I don't know. Well, it's a good question. And this is the last one for me. Uh, the Avalanche won the cup this year. There's a cup day in Eden Prairie. 
uh, what's the day look like? Like, where do you bring the cup? Where does Casey bring the cup? And like, obviously you'll be obviously along for it, but what's that day like? It's funny because we were actually just talking about like whether or not we would touch it. And I don't think <laughs> either of us would touch it, but um, I think he'd for sure bring it to like Bear Path where we, where we play and I'm sure he'd stop at Hazel team. Yeah. Um, community, Eden Prairie Community Center for sure. Um, where else? I think those are really good options. Um, yeah, Eden Prairie Community Center just to bring it. I remember Nick Letty doing it back when the uh, Blackhawks won it. And that was like a big thing for our community. Like people were totally pumped about that. So I can imagine Casey doing something like that. And uh, or just like bringing it home too. Like, you know, that's yeah. where it all started was at our house. So. Yeah. Could your dad get on the ice now? Like his skills gotten better over the years that he had <laughs> the three of you guys. Like, is he like what's where is it at right now? Like, has he been able to get beyond the D three and? You know, I don't know where his skills are at now, but uh, he used to dish us pucks for like one timers, and yeah. he always had a pretty good pass. Um, skating skills, I don't know where those are at. It's probably been. 10 years now since he's put his skates on. He had the rollerblades on the other day. Oh, yeah. He threw my rollerblades on, and I was – we were all scared for our lives. <laughs> he was he was super confident, and then all of a sudden he gets on him, and he's like, oh, and we're holding on to him. And I don't know. Yeah, we were all scared for yeah, him. Yeah, he's a little wobbly. Yeah. God, yeah, I'm, I'm a first-generation player too. Like my dad, like southwest Minnesota and Nebraska for all of his upbringing, so he played basketball, football, and baseball. Mm -hmm. The first time he came out and skated, I think I was like eight or nine, and he came out, made it like 20 minutes, got off, said it hurt his feet too bad, and he was done. And like we knew right away, it's like because me and my brother could skate better than him, and we were little kids. And he yeah. just like, like, no, this isn't for me. I'm out. I always remember our dad like being a good skater though for some reason. Yeah. Like he was good at skating when he was when we were younger. Well, he played. He he'd always played pond hockey growing up, so that's kind of where his yeah. like love for the game came from. Yeah, okay. Threw us out there. Yeah. So, well, nice. we got a uh, one last uh, question to wrap it up for you guys. Thanks so much for the time. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm sure you got to get to class or somewhere. Um, Scott, take away. Yeah, and we'll, we'll twist it up a little bit here since there's uh, two of you. But we've got our waggle golf question. Get your waggle on dot com promo code SP10 if you want 10 percent off that order. We've been asking everyone who is in their dream golf foursome. So this is like. It can be friends if that, that's really the route you want to go, but it can be hockey players, it can be golfers, it can be historical people, dead or alive. Yeah. But for the two of you, we're gonna draft it. Wow. Snake All draft. Right. You can't you can't have any overlap here. All right, who's got uh, first? I mean, John's older, so he gets the choice whether he wants to go first or if he wants to defer because he thinks he's just gonna do that much better than you. Um, you go first. All right, Tiger Woods. First overall. Tiger no Woods. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And for the first one here, we're going to give you a back to back, John, to balance it for the snake. And then after that, we'll just go every other. So give me two. Who are your two guys? Um, Sidney Crosby. Nice. And Roman Yossi. Wow. Roman Yossi. Okay. Wow, cool. <laughs> I like that. All right. Luke, who do you got? Who do I want here? I would say um, my favorite player on the wild is like Ryan Suter. So we were big Ryan Suter guys. I feel like I think I'd want him in there for yeah, sure. For sure. Um, who else? Probably like I want to, I want to golf with pro players cause they are insane. Probably like Rory McIlroy. I want to see how good he is. Yeah, true. True. I should. Okay. So yeah. McIlroy, Tiger, and Ryan Suter. Ryan Suter. Yeah. What what a grouping. Okay. And then John, you got one more to round out your foursome. Uh I would say um I would gotta go with someone that's super cool. Yeah, I would go like Jack Nicholas. See see where his game's at. See if he's right. probably can still play for sure. Yeah, uh still us. I'm well, sure this one yet has said John Daly. Yeah, yeah, that was that was, one yeah. Pick. yeah that I was, was going to go Michael Jordan, but I don't because I know he's a big gambler, so that would be fun to watch. So I don't know. I was sure. stressed out. <laughs> might have to trade Ryan Suter for Michael Jordan unless it's mm -hmm. too late. Sorry, Ryan. Yeah. That, 
huh? That's that's a tough go. All right, yeah. that, this just in: Ryan Suter just got bought out from your foursome, replaced yeah. by Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, welcome to the team. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for doing this. I know it ran a little later than we thought, uh, but thanks so much for having so much fun about with this and. Uh, Looking forward to seeing you guys play in the tournament, and you never know. There could be uh, another Frozen 4 appearance, and you don't have to go very far to get there. So uh, yep. best luck to you guys in the next yep. few weeks. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Well, Joe, I think the uh, bar has been set pretty high. If we ever get Casey Middlestat on here to match uh, what we just got mm -hmm. from John and Luke, but uh, I can really appreciate those guys taking the time. That was a lot of fun. As anybody who's had siblings can can share, some of the best stories comes from your siblings, and especially when they had a chance to loosen up a bit and give each other some crap over stuff. But I do, I did love this the anecdote about finding out about the trade with Casey and this at practice and like getting the the heads up about it and like having to tell like Motsko asking the question of what happened, where to go, and then like I found out from an internet how he texted me before the practice. No one else <laughs> broke it to me. So uh, great personalities, obviously, and and you know great features here uh, in the sport, and obviously. Um, as the Gophers hope a longer career uh, in Minnesota versus uh, leaving early. Yeah, that would be ideal for sure. Um, now let's kick it over to Keyboard Warriors, brought to you by Barrel Theory Beer Company. Just a 15-minute walk down the street from the X, folks, uh, whether it's for pregame, postgame, or going there to hang out during the game if you're not getting tickets. If you are at the game, you can find their stuff at section 105 for the crawler of the day or get raindrops on tap at section 112, section 217, and up on the club level at C36. Uh, today, I'm back on uh, my old shit with Shooter McGavin. Uh, it is one of my personal favorites. Uh, they actually have a, a different version, Joe. As soon as it pops back up, I'm making you try it. Shredder McGavin, which is just mm -hmm. their double dry hopped version of their Shooter McGavin here. Hazy double IPA, 8.2%. That is just dangerous for the golf course, but I love it. Um, but this week's hot takes, we've got a couple First one is a bit of a word salad, but uh, I think we, we've got enough to work off of here from uh, longtime supporter Sean Cosgrove. Minnesota Wild Twitter is filled with a bunch of whiners. Many want the team to tank for high draft picks, but don't seem to understand what that really looks like or realize that there are teams which tank and still end up with a mediocre team five years later. Examples he lists are Detroit, Buffalo, and Florida, until very recently, uh, there is a good uh, a good case for rational optimism, but some who are active Wild fans seem to want to complain. There's about a year left on the buyout penalties, and the Wild will have thirteen million dollars to spend. It's getting better by the dip. That's a a mouthful right there. Um, it was not just a hot take; it was a long take. Um, so. Uh, I, I do think that there are a lot of things that you could be excited about if you're a wild fan, notably you talked about Faber and, and Rossi, uh, Esper Wellstat, um, goalie of the future, um, you know, Boldy as at times shows he can be a, a star and Kirill Kaprizov, assuming he stays, um, has been terrific this year, another 40 goal season. Like there's maybe, uh, you know, 10, 11, 12 players in the league that are like him and you can't find those players anywhere. So, a lot of good things. Uh, I would just the the tanking thing. I, I agree with because I think that you have to do a lot right to make tanking work, and it takes a long time. And I haven't been in Minnesota long enough to understand their patience. I guess they have been patient since it's been twenty plus years and have got yeah. past the first round, and they still keep coming back. So I guess I, sh I shouldn't disregard the patience and the the perseverance there. But the difference between being a playoff team losing the first round and being a team that is the San Jose Sharks and is a brutal night every time you go watch them play mm -hmm. and, you know, last place in the league. Like it's, you know, the place will be empty or not empty, but, you know, it'll not be as full. Like it'll be, it's a lot of pain to get to where you want to go. And if you have to do it right to make the pain worth it. So um, I don't think there's a problem with a reset, you know, where you might let some veteran guys go and bring in some youth and, 
if you had to reset some of your core, which is, I think, was the argument made before maybe some of the extensions that were done early in the offseason. But I think to just say, just tank and see what you get. Um, yeah. The Steve Eisenman has been one of the best executives in the league, and he's still on year six, I think, in Detroit. Um, you know, Tampa took a long time from when they first started the rebuild back in 2009. They won a Stanley Cup in 2020. They had a lot of great runs there, um, but they also hit a lot of their picks that made that happen. You know, Kucherov second round, Braden Point one pick before the Wild in the third round, uh, Vasilevsky number 19 overall when no one taking Russian goalies in the first round, uh, Palat seventh rounder. You know, you in order for that to work, you need to to hit on a lot of those guys. And so yeah. just to say to tank and then let's say they tank and they get the number eight overall pick, right? Sure. You know, or whatever it might be. But you know, uh, I'll, I'll counter that though, Joe, cause I do, <laughs> I, I agree with the sentiment entirely. And I agree with Cosgrove that like, you can't just like decide all of a sudden you're going to tank. Right. <laughs> but the, the real frustration for the fan base that I completely understand is like you said, we're on like 24 years now where they've never even been open to the idea. They are aggressively Band-Aid fixing and doing everything they can to stay in the middle. When we've seen historically, the teams that are contending for the Stanley Cup more often than not bottomed out and built from that. And you're right, you got to hit on the guys like Kucherov, Palat, mm -hmm. Point. We're seeing right now that, uh, again, it hasn't come to fruition because we don't have a lot of the guys up yet, but Judd Brackett is doing a good job with what he's been given. You can hit on the later ones, but Tampa, they got Stamkos and Hedman. Like that yeah. can't win. Even if everything else went right, like you said, you need Stamkos and Hedman if you want to be in this game. And they've never had that level of talent. They've never picked that early. They've never had a generational game-changing player. Kaprizov's mm -hmm. the first guy that's really even in that discussion, and he kind of fell in their lap because everyone was worried about Russia. So it's more... I understand the frustration with being completely against a rebuild versus, you know, supporting them saying, Hey, let's tank now. Like it's not that easy. The players aren't going to just all of a sudden tank. They're playing for their next contracts and they have pride, but I, I do support the fans in just being frustrated that Craig Leopold has done everything in his power to avoid any kind of rebuild for the reasons you said, right? If you're not putting together a good product, you're not going to sell the same level of tickets, and it is a business. But at a certain point, you got to evaluate what is the investment here, having bad years that lead to potentially deeper playoff runs and more money, winning the Stanley Cup. But there's no guarantee that you can do it either. So it's a real fine line to walk. Yeah, like the, if you're rebuilding, does Kaprizov say, right? right? Or do you make you make Kaprizov being dealt as part of your rebuilding plan, right? Totally. Um, decisions were made earlier that lead to the whole not rebuilding plan, such as resigning like Spurgeon and Brodeen to long-term deals and, and all that stuff, you know? So you can't run like a bare bones operation or you shouldn't at least. And so no. um, I think in the, and the, maybe it's the fool's gold, but always saying, well, in, in NHL, no matter how you get in, it doesn't have to be the first place in the division. Like yeah. teams every year find a way to, from like the, number one wild card to go so all it takes is getting in as is, is kind of the selling point versus we're not the best team in the league every year but we get, yeah you know, but i also I, I get that but those teams have rosters that are in a position where you look at it and go oh yeah they started bad and they're like on a heater now and it makes total sense like i'm sorry the going back to like 2012 i threw so much money on the la kings when they got mm -hmm. in as the eight seed because of their construct and how they were playing others aren't as obvious like no one knew that florida was going to go on the run that they did last year but you still look at the roster and you say they've got the pieces like this makes more sense where i don't think or tampa, or tampa this year too like tampa yeah, like totally be the first wild card <laughs> yeah whereas this year with the wild like even if they got in like they haven't beaten any of those teams that are up ahead of them in the, right. play, in the playoffs they haven't yeah have a horrible record against dallas winnipeg colorado even the blues, even Nashville. The blues. Like, yeah. so like, so if they do get in, like, are they going to be a, a hot pick to be one of those wild cards that go on a run? I don't think so. Like mm -hmm. obviously fans would still eat up the playoff tickets the first round and enjoy that. But yeah, it is, you know, it is a, an entertaining discussion about rebuild versus not, but um, it's clearly in, in the <laughs> DNA for 
Craig Leopold and Bill Guerin not to rebuild, and which is why they made decisions that they have. Totally. Nope. Very fair. Turn the page to a quick one from me. The Bachelor was Minnesota's best shot at a championship, and it ended in poetic fashion. And uh, between everything I do with watching hockey, uh, different productions for uh, podcasts across the Soda Pod, <clears throat> uh, part of the agreement is I get to sit down with her on Monday nights and watch The Bachelor. And tell you what, it is the most typical Minnesota story ever. Nice, sweet Minnesota girl has this great backstory of how she persevered through like huge hearing impediments and a lot of like medical challenges. And now she's just normal functioning person, sweetheart. And she was the favorite and front runner through the entire show. We get to the finale and all of a sudden he's just like so clearly not about her and like trying to slowly tell her like, by the way, I'm not picking you. And it, it's just the perfect metaphor for Minnesota sports in general. Is it not? It, it feels that way. Like the Minnesota nice too nice, uh, um, or coming, uh, coming in, uh, not last, but not, not first. Right. So right. at least, uh, I guess love, love is blind is filming in Minneapolis right now. And so <laughs> someone from Minneapolis will find a partner guaranteed in that since they're all kind of from Minneapolis. So, yeah, we would think so. Right. One well, that the best part, Joe, at, even to add more fuel to the flame at the end, I don't know how familiar you are with the bachelor, but the two of them have to, uh, the final two go up to the bachelor individually and find out like, you know, they're like, he's either going to propose or he's going to let them down. And it's like on this big stage, it's like a whole ensemble. And she got there and is talking to him and he's being really nice and like friendly. And all of a sudden she's like, and I'm I'm so happy with you, but I know you're not picking me. And he just like stopped and froze and like broke down. And like she basically pulled the plug before he had the chance to, which I feel like is so many Minnesota fans where it's like, we have so much like possibility. There's so much reason for optimism. They're like, I know this story. I know how it ends. I'm not going to let myself believe. I'm not. <laughs> I was like hurting yourself before someone hurts you, right? So yeah. <laughs> that's going to be uh, the way to do it. So fitting, so fitting. All right, last one here for this week, and uh, kind of interesting coming off of our interview here, Joe. Uh, Jeremy, Herdsman11 on Twitter, if Nyes and Cooley came back, the Gophers would be in a similar position they are now. The unsung heroes of last year's squad was the decor. I mean, I think... I mean, if Nyes and Cooley came back, like obviously they wouldn't, they'd be a number one seed in the region, I think. Right. You know, probably. Yeah. But, um, but I think you're that, that take is right that the blue line hasn't really had a drop off since last year. Um, and because they had Lacombe and Faber left and, and all that, and Johnson, but they're guys that have come up and, and played so well to where, you know, I don't, it's hard to say that they're better than last year because of the guys that they had in the in NHL talent, but they certainly haven't been a weakness for them this year. And, but yeah. I think the time will tell whether they are as good in the, in the playoffs here. This is where it'll really show in the regional and go into the frozen four. But um, yeah, I mean, if those guys came back, it obviously would have been a lot much easier road, I think, to get to this point and think about the top six, what that would have looked like uh, if they did. Oh, the, the top six is insane if they're back, mm -hmm. but I, I agree with the sentiment. And it is interesting because Bob Motzko, every time he gets asked, I know you've asked him in post game scrums, like the blue line, how have they held up? And like he applauds them and says they're every bit as good as last year. I think that's a little aggressive, right? And I mean, no uh, shots at Luke Middlestack because he's part of both. So either way, he comes out the winner. But mm -hmm. I, I actually think it's an interesting point because I was all focused. Like if Logan Cooley just comes back, this team mm -hmm. is set. If you could choose between having the same blue line as last year or getting Nyes and Cooley back, I think I'm picking the blue line. I think I am. I don't know. that. That's a really interesting one. That's tough. Yeah. And make sure to play them in overtime. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah, that, oh, that, we're not going to talk about that. Um, now we're hurting people. Uh, <laughs> but no, uh, Jeremy, that's a really good one. I actually like that a lot. It actually makes me stop and think, and I'm not 100% sure which way I'd go. Let's put it this way. I'd be thrilled if either was the case, but uh, I, I lean to the decor. It's 
it's, it was unbelievable last year. And like, I know, I mean, Moscow has said that and I'm, I'm sure he does, you know, his own heart believe that. And it speaks to how the depth and how the young guys have stepped up ter terrifically, yeah. but you know, Brock Faber is an all world like defender. Jackson Lacombe's playing for the ducks like Johnson and those guys that are playing there now will be NHL players, of course. Yeah. Um, but um, the amount of experience that they lost, like two couple seniors and a, a junior, like it's, it's hard to replace that experience. hundred percent. Well, again, everyone be on the lookout each week for the uh, hot take post. We need some of the keyboard warriors to step up and give us more ridiculousness to address. Um, Joe, wrapping up here, we got hopefully uh, we're going to do some digging, like you said, but uh, we're pretty sure the one dollar a month deal is still active for the athletic. But uh, last chance to pump either the latest uh articles that already dropped or the ones we've got coming up here uh the the one the dollar per month uh for 12 months is going back through the through the end of the month here so you can use that uh up until early next week would be my guess since it's end of end of march so keep on trying for that um we will have um obviously coverage of the wilds pivotal games down the stretch i will have a bunch of stories coming from iowa including spending afternoon with uh yes for wall stat having a coffee with him and talk about his experience uh his debut and how that changed him a bit um just kind of off the ice stuff with him uh first off talk to him for a while just of how uh him being back and and how he could add to the russian core in minnesota that's growing um riley Heights story is posting on wednesday when this podcast comes out um and we will have a lot of frozen four coverage uh regardless of who is in it um especially if the gophers are in it but um i will be uh on seventh there in St. Paul for that, that whole week. Uh, so looking forward to seeing all you guys there. Yeah. We might have to come up with some kind of like grab beers, meet and greet type thing. I know yeah. we got our uh, prospect guy, uh, as everyone knows him spoke Z flying in mm -hmm. for the frozen four. We'll do something. We'll figure it out and let you all know. Um, well, awesome. Uh, you're all awesome by the way. Anyone, I don't care where you're tuning in, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever. Uh, please continue to share this with your mom, your brother, your friend, whatever. Uh, give us five-star reviews if you can on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. It just helps us bump the show more. Uh, give us your favorite beer. Give us a ridiculous take. Whatever you want, throw it in there, and we'll incorporate it into future shows. And do check out the YouTube channel. Subscribe if you haven't already for podcast recordings, clips from interviews, and uh, the highlight reels that keep on coming. Uh, Spoke Z is going to have one for Ogren, one for Kumpelainen, one for Wallstedt, all coming up here in the next month or so. So do stay tuned. But we appreciate all of you for continuing to tune in to Fellowship of the Rink. You stay classy. State of Hockey.